My next topic I'm sure will interest all of you. I want to talk to you now about black holes. Simply speaking, a black hole is what's left after a large star dies. You're already aware that a star is an energy producer, a nuclear fusion reactor. Its core is a gigantic nuclear fusion bomb that's trying to explode. But its mass of surrounding gases is so large that its gravity contains the explosion, and the balance that exists between the gravity and the fusion is what determines the star's size. However, as a star gets older, as it ages, its fuels get used up and its nuclear reactor slows down, and then its gravity gets the upper hand. The star implodes. Gravity pulls inward and compresses the stellar material into the star's center. As it's compressed, the core heats up tremendously, and then, at some point, a supernova, a great explosion occurs, and the stellar material and a lot of radiation are blasted out into space. Only the extremely dense, extremely massive core is left. Its gravitational field is so strong that nothing can escape it, not even light so it disappears from view. It's black. It's now a black hole. Now, the idea of a black hole, an object with so much gravity that it won't let light escape, was first proposed more than 200 years ago, in 1795, by a French mathematician, Pierre Laplace. He used Newton's gravitational theory to calculate that if an object was compressed small enough, it would require an escape velocity of almost 300,000 kilometers per second, the speed of light. More recently, the name of Stephen Hawking, the great British physicist, has become synonymous with black hole theory. A black hole consists of two parts, a singularity and an event horizon. Its singularity is the point where its gravity is indefinitely strong and its mass is indefinitely dense and this point is theoretically at the center of the black hole's core. And its event horizon is the perimeter around the core at the distance where its gravity is still strong enough to pull light into itself, at the distance where escape velocity equals the speed of light, and where nothing can escape its pull. Both the singularity and the event horizon are intangible, of course, but both of them can be calculated mathematically. The distance of the event horizon from the core is called the Schwarzschild radius, and this radius is equal to 2gm divided by c squared, where g is Newton's gravitational constant, m equals the mass of the core, and c equals the speed of light. Even though we can't see them, black holes do exist, and we can prove their existence in three basic ways. One way is to search for celestial objects that are very small, but that have a very large mass. For example, the astronomical feature called M87 is only about the size of our solar system, but it weighs 3 billion times more than our Sun. So it's a good bet that M87 is a black hole. Another way to find a black hole is to search for matter that's accelerating because a black hole accelerates anything that approaches it. As the matter gets sucked in, it speeds up and heats up, and this superheated matter produces X-rays, which can be detected. The star Cygnus X1 is a strong X-ray source, so there is a good possibility that there's a black hole in its neighborhood. And finally, a black hole can be detected using Einstein's theory of relativity, which tells us that gravity can actually bend space, warp space. An object with a lot of gravity located between Earth and a more distant star can bend that star's light like a lens or a prism does. This is called the gravitational lens effect. In 1996, a gravitational lens passed between Earth and Macho 96 BL5 and the temporarily brightened image was photographed by both the Hubble Space Telescope and ground observers. Black holes are a bit frightening, but if the idea of a black hole sucking in the rest of the universe upsets you, let's put them into perspective. 
A black hole doesn't suck in everything in sight. It only affects nearby material. If a black hole with the same mass suddenly replaced our sun, then its Schwarzschild radius would be only 3 kilometers compared to our sun's radius of 700,000 kilometers. And since Earth is 150 million kilometers from the sun, it would be in no danger of being sucked in. Without the sun though, Earth would be very cold and lifeless, I'm afraid. Listen to part of a university lecture on American social history. Before we examine the modern American entertainment industry, Broadway shows, Hollywood movies, rock concerts, television, and all that, let's take a short look at the beginnings of organized entertainment in America. Almost since the very beginning of the country, Americans had been able to enjoy itinerant performances of one kind or another, shows that traveled around to find their audiences in towns and villages across the continent. Traveling medicine shows offering jugglers and music along with their snake oil and miracle tonics were popular. Then there were Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West shows with trick riders and dramatic reenactments which toured the country as did several circuses like Barnum and Bailey's. And then there were the showboats, paddle wheelers carried music and comedy up and down our river systems, up and down the Mississippi River and the Missouri River and the Ohio River. Meanwhile, town halls, saloons and music halls, dime museums and burlesque houses all sprang up across the country wherever people had some money to burn and were looking for a little fun. But then, after the Civil War, after 1865, America's social structure began to change, change radically. The country began to grow economically and its cities began to grow, and an American middle class began to develop with increased spending power and leisure time. This was also a time of industrial growth and transportation, and communication technologies improved rapidly. Businesses became large and national in scope. And it was at this same time that entertainment became an industry, with the appearance of vaudeville. Vaudeville was something new, the first mass entertainment in that it no longer catered to just the gullible or to those looking for the risque. From its inception, it was geared toward middle class men and women and families, and it very quickly spread nationwide. Its performance halls were alcohol free and its hall managers demanded decorum no spitting on the floor or jeering the axe, and its performers were denied the use of broady material. Vaudeville was the first family entertainment. Theater historians usually date Vaudeville's beginning at October 24, 1881, when a former circus ringmaster, Tony Pastor, first offered polite variety programs in his New York City theaters. Pastor hoped to draw his audience from the uptown shopping traffic, from the salaried workers and their wives and children. He barred alcohol sales and risque material from his theaters, and he offered luxurious facilities, and he gave outdoor prizes like hams and coal to his patrons, and his idea proved so successful that other theater managers soon followed suit. Incredibly, by the 1890s, Vaudeville has already developed into regional and national chains of theaters with sophisticated booking and contract systems. At its height, Vaudeville performed before a broad range of theater sizes and economic classes, the so-called small time and medium time and big time, and it was the big time that all of its entertainers hoped to rise to. The big time, with its palatial urban theaters and its salaries of several thousand dollars a week. An act could be just about anything that was entertaining and inoffensive. Escape artists like the great Houdini, high divers, contortionists, hypnotists, lap dancers, trained animals, every imaginable kind of novelty act. And of course, there were the headliners, the singers and dancers and comedians whose popularity drew the customers. Some of their careers outlasted vaudeville. W.C. Fields, Will Rogers, Al Jolson, Kate Smith, Eddie Cantor, George Burns, Jack Benny. These names you might not recognize now, 
but they were some of the greatest vaudevillians who went on as far as the early years of movies and then television and set the performance standards in those media as well, who set many of the performance styles we still enjoy today. At the beginning of the 20th century in 1902, the new medium of the motion picture, an early silent movie, was first incorporated into a vaudeville bill between the live acts. Thirty years later, on November 16, 1932, New York's Palace Theater, the capital of vaudeville, offered its first exclusively cinematic presentation, and this is considered vaudeville's official end. The point in time where movies overtook live performances in the hearts of American audiences. For vaudeville itself, it was a relatively brief stardom, only about 50 years from start to finish. But actually, the spirit of vaudeville lived on. Its performers moved into the movies or onto Broadway, and then many of these stars moved on to television. And we'll be looking at these media next. Listen to part of a university lecture on animal behavior by a professor of biology. We're looking at animal behavior this week, and let's turn now, class, to one of its most dramatic manifestations, animal mimicry. Organisms that are good to eat or that are attacked for other reasons often develop devices, through evolution of course, techniques and devices to protect themselves from their attackers in order to survive and in order to reproduce and pass their genes on to the next generation. And one of these techniques, one of these strategies, is to look like something else, to look like something that is not good to eat or something that is otherwise of no interest to the predator. An organism that does this, that resembles something else, is called a mimic, and the thing that it has evolved to resemble is called the model, while the predator that it is trying to mislead is called the recipient, the one that receives the misleading image. Some mimics do this by adopting camouflage, which is a cryptic resemblance to something of no interest to its enemy, and by doing this, they become invisible, they are hidden. Many animals, insects, uh, lizards, amphibians, mimic the abundant plant life in the habitat around them. I'm sure that you've seen green grasshoppers and brown moths that seem to be well hidden on grass stems and tree trunks when they're motionless. But the leaf-tailed gecko, a small lizard in Madagascar, is a master at this. It avoids its enemies by looking exactly like a cluster of old dead leaves. And there are various species of katydids, grasshopper-like insects that have managed to duplicate the appearance of leaves with startling accuracy. In all stages of growth, some species looking like fresh green leaves and others looking like old decaying leaves, complete with leaf veins, weathered edges, and mildew spots. These adaptations make these animals difficult or impossible for a predator to identify or even notice, and so these otherwise defenseless creatures are overlooked or passed by. Other organisms defend themselves directly with stings or bites or with poisons or other noxious chemicals, and such organisms often assume bold, characteristic colors and markings, called warning coloration, that warns a predator, reminds it, that this creature can inflict pain or discomfort, or that it tastes very bad. The bold orange and black pattern of the common monarch butterfly, or the black and yellow bands on a bumblebee, are such warning colorations. And sometimes this warning coloration is so effective that another species, a species that doesn't have any of the protective devices of sting or poison or whatever, will adopt the same warning colors and pattern. This sort of mimicry is called Batesian mimicry. The name comes from the early zoologist H.W. Bates, who back in 1862 first suggested an explanation for the origins of mimicry based on Charles Darwin's new theory of natural selection. This was one of the earliest applications of Darwin's ideas to an unknown biological phenomenon. 
Now, Viceroy butterflies taste good to many birds, but because they mimic the monarch butterflies model's color pattern, because Viceroy butterflies look like monarch butterflies, they are avoided, just like the monarch is. In the same way, many harmless fly species resemble the bumblebee model, and also in this way they avoid being eaten by the recipients, birds. So these are bastion mimics. There are several conditions that must be fulfilled though for a bastion mimic to be successful. The mimic must of course share the same general region and habitat as its model, but the mimic must also be less numerous than its model which must be relatively abundant. That way, the odds are that the recipient predator will sample an unpalatable model first, which is very important for keeping the trick effective. A similar kind of mimicry is Mullerian mimicry, named after another early biologist. And in this sort of mimicry, both the model and the mimic are dangerous or taste bad. A very obvious example is the way that so many unrelated species of bees, wasps, and ants have assumed similar bold black and yellow or black and orange banded patterns. By doing this, Mullerian mimics present a united image that predators soon learn to be weary of. There's also another aspect of mimicry that I'd like to mention too, and that's the mimicry used by predators. This is called aggressive mimicry, and it is used to conceal or misrepresent a predator until its prey comes near enough to capture. Many mantids, for example, are green or brown so that they blend in with their plant surroundings. But some tropical mantids are fantastically shaped and colored, like the beautiful orchid mantis, which resembles a petal of one of those tropical flowers and it hides motionless next to one of these orchids until an insect comes within its reach. There are also several green-colored vine and grass snakes of various families which lie invisible among the tangled vines and branches of the jungle until they suddenly lash out to grab their prey. Actually, there are an endless number of ingenious mimics in the natural world, and I recommend that you all try a Google Images search tonight for some more interesting examples of this fascinating behavior. History Class Benjamin Franklin was a renowned statesman, a successful proprietor, an avid philosopher, and a prolific sci uh, inventor. As we learned from our reading this week, his inventions include bifocals, the Franklin stove, the odometer, and of course the lightning rod. Today, though, I want to argue the case that Franklin's greatest legacy was not in any of those roles or as a founding father of the United States, but as a writer. Do any of you know a book that Franklin has written? Anyone? Well, that's because Franklin wrote, uh, didn't write any great novels, a la later U.S. greats like Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and Mark Twain. <clears throat> But I think an analysis of Franklin's writing style, his instincts, his sensibilities, and his accomplishments reveals that he deserves to be mentioned in the same breath as those literary giants. Like Hemingway, Franklin began as a newspaper reporter, then moved on to publish essays, journals, and books. His most famous books are Autobiography, The Way to Wealth, and Poor Richard's Almanac an annual publication that he founded and authored from 1732 to 1748. Franklin's first literary contributions were essays printed in 1722 in the New England Current, a newspaper published by his brother James. Ben's writing style at this time was modeled principally upon that of the Spectator, a British paper edited by Joseph Addison and Richard Steele. Early on, though, Franklin displayed an innate ability to write concise, clear news stories. In 1729, he became publisher and editor of the Pennsylvania Gazette, which he developed into a newspaper universally acclaimed as the best in American colonies. 
Franklin made three great contributions to American literature. First was his preference to share his opinion about popular topics instead of simply reporting on current events, um, much in the vein of a modern newspaper columnist. Through his writings, Franklin helped shape America's national identity by shifting Americans' consciousness from a spiritual puritism to a uh, secular rationalism, which was characteristic of 18th century enlightenment. He thus created a pers uh, uh, dawning awareness that America was a country with distinctly different values and interests than those of England. Poor Richard's Almanac and his autobiography, for example, are written in the style of self-help guides. They're packed with enlightenment maxims, such as an investment in knowledge pays the best interest, uh, time is money, and hear reason or shall make you feel her. Franklin imbued his journalism with a similar tone. In an article entitled Death of a Drunk, for instance, he used a true story to pass on a moral lesson about the dangers of drinking. Author Robert Arner said that Franklin's writings demonstrate a um, deep and abiding belief in the power of the press to educate the public on topical issues. Franklin's second contribution was his sense for unusual and interesting news stories which set a tone that has carried over to modern newspapers. The Pennsylvania Gazette specialized in brief, offbeat articles, such as a husband who tried to decapitate his wife's adulterer, and a fiddler who saved his fiddle, but not his wife, from a capsized canoe. Although some criticize this as sensationalistic or yellow journalism, Franklin's venerable wisdom and natural wit permeated the short reports and attracted a huge and loyal audience. <clears throat> In this sense, we might call Franklin the father of tabloid journalism. So you can thank Ben next time you're in a supermarket checkout line and see the headline, Michael Jackson Spotted on UFO. Franklin's third significant contribution to U.S. literature is his writing style, which reflects the philosophy he expressed in a 1732 essay. Good writing, he said, should be, quote, smooth, clear, and short. Compared with other 18th century authors, Franklin's writing is much more concise and readable. That comparison holds not only among his contemporaries, however, but also among writers in the following three centuries. Franklin played a leading role in developing journalism as a terse writing form, getting quickly to the point and dwelling on important issues instead of secondary facts. Moreover, Franklin was a word economist, finding the shortest way to express a thought, as demonstrated by his vast coinages of aphorisms. The chief reason Franklin's sayings remain popular today is due not to their moral wisdom, but to their brevity. Advice such as, well done is better than well said, when in doubt, don't, dispense moral certitudes in sentences that are catchy and easy to remember, a timeless writing tip. How many of you have heard your English teacher mention KISS, K-I-S-S? -S? What does that mean? Keep it short and simple. Yep, keep it short and simple. That was a formula Ben Franklin was practicing long before someone coined a name for it. Given all this, it's no wonder that Scottish philosopher David Hume called Franklin America's first great man of letters.